So folks, I have a friend who is going through something very serious and traumatic. And I thought, well, what can I do to help? And I thought, well, I have a show. I have a show. So let's, and many of you have asked me because you saw me reposting her stuff because I support her and her family. Um, makes that very clear. I support her and her family. Makes that very clear. I'm taking my stand. Um, but you are wondering what was going on and what is going on. So I thought, let me ring her up and she answered and said, let's talk about it so you guys can understand Something that could happen to you, I mean, or somebody happen to somebody in your family. Like these are, I don't think that this could happen. This is like a soap opera by itself, but it's not funny. Um, but mm -hmm. I want to welcome my friend Martha Byrne. Hi, Martha. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. You're so kind. Well, first of all, how are you today? I know everything's day by day. How are you today? Today I'm great. I think that you know when you go through something that we'll walk through. When you go through something of this magnitude, there is no map, there's no playbook, there is no way to prepare yourself for it because it's so out of something that no one should ever go through and, and very few people do. It is a club that nobody should be belong to, but we're doing really well under the circumstances. Um, you know, when you go through something again, traumatic and difficult, you find your, your warriors with you, you find your army and you rely on them. I'm staying with Laura Lee here in California, and she's been such a, Laura Lee Bell's been such a wonderful friend for my entire life. But when this happened to me, and you really find out who your friends are and who's got your back, no matter what, and she's one of those people. And um, I'm, you know, humbled by her friendship and the other people that have stood behind us and next to us through this process. Yeah, you do find out, don't you? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You do, but, I want to, but there's one positive thing I didn't want to mention before we get into this stuff. Your son Michael got sworn in as police officer in New Jersey. He did. He I did. 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 Isn't that exciting? I'm yeah. so proud of him. I I feel like with all of this that's happened and what he's witnessed over the last three years about the justice system and the injustice of some parts of the system, that he would want to take this on after what he's seen is it tells me that what we've done and in, in our messaging to him has gotten through, which is that his father is a hero. His father had spent his entire career of service to others. And through the process, they couldn't find anything that he had ever done in his life, like in his career, that was bad, you know? And as a police officer, they, they tried very, very hard to look back 20, 25 years to see like, is there anything on his record that's bad, you know? And there wasn't. So my son, you know, what I loved about his, the police department that he's on they came to the house, you know, and after they had picked him, they wanted him on their squad and they were just so wonderful and open. And like, if you ever need anything, you know, we're here for him and for you, your family now. And that's what I know about the police department. That's what I experienced when my husband was on the NYPD, how when he was hurt on the job that 400 police officers came to Jacoby Medical Center to see him and the mayor and the police commissioner, like that's the family of law enforcement that I experienced in, in our lives. So to have my son stand there and have, I mean, I was extremely <laughs> emotional, yeah. obviously, you yeah. know, and he's gonna be an amazing police officer. He was substitute teaching before this and and had, a, and they loved him, the kids loved him. He's just gonna, he's gonna be wonderful for the community and uh, his life's about to change in a, in a very dramatic way, but he, he's ready. Oh, good. You got excited. That's so exciting. I come from a law enforcement family too, so I know the good, the bad, and the both. But my, but in my, yeah, in my family, it's been wonderful. I mean, they are they they do. I mean, my Great. stepfather passed away last year, and he was airport oh, police at LAX for thirty three years. Okay. Um, after the Navy for twenty years. So I mean, the folks, the, the oh, out of the, I mean, of the police department, just they just were all like, they they, they came, they took care of my mom. They kind of enwrapped my mother who needed it. That's what happened yeah. to me too. Yeah, it happened to me too. My husband was injured on the job and he was, uh, you know, they would come and help with groceries and like trap yes. if I needed to see somewhere to go. And uh, it really is a, a community that is unlike anything else I've ever experienced. So I'm glad that he's in, I love where he is. I love the people that he's going to be working with. And we have a next generation of the good guys coming through, which is nice. Did you, okay, with all your kids, did you know one would possibly go into that same thing? You never know if one's going to go acting like you, or one's going to go to the police. Like, did you have an idea that he would? No, be? no, because he's much more like me in the sense that if anybody was going to go into show business, it would have been him because he's, he's oh, funny. extremely funny, very outgoing, fearless, completely fearless. 
And then when he said he wanted to do this as a police officer, I was surprised. I was genuinely surprised, but yet at the same time, not because he is so good with people and he does love interacting with people. And um, my other two had no interest in, in the industry at all, in the entertainment industry at all. Uh, my one son works for a service manager for Subaru and my, my daughter's going to go to college for health and wellness and maybe do, become a nurse. So, but you know, usually you see it when they're little, if they're going to be in yeah. the industry, you know, you would see the, the, the signs, but he never took, he never really went in that direction. My oldest son, he didn't really take lessons or want to do it. So it, it he, I'm glad that he's doing what he's doing. The uh, the entertainment industry is a whole other beast. Oh, that, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no map for that either. No. You know a little bit about that. Some, no. A little bit about that. I yeah. do. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. A lifetime of it. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. I know. It's crazy. Um, okay. So we got we to get out the way. I uh, also want to ask you, how is your husband doing these days? Thank you than. for asking. He's okay. I think he is, you know, the, in, the, the initial disappointment of people, anyone thinking that he would ever break the law was a realization for him that was very painful. Like, how could anybody look at my career, look at what I've done in my life as a human being, as a police officer, as a husband, as a, you know, all these, all the things he's done and everything that I would sell out our country for $5,000, sacrifice my family's safety for $5,000. You know, he doesn't betray anybody. I mean, he's he's so, uh, he loved what he did. See, that's another thing. He loved being a police officer and then he was injured on the job severely in a police chase, hit a telephone pole at 50 miles an hour. And he was devastated when that happened. Like he... He had been a school safety sergeant, so he was in charge of 40 public and private schools in the Bronx. He had been in street crime, which was very, I mean, took thousands of illegal guns off the street. He was in a police shooting in Times Square on New Year's Eve, where he saved hundreds of lives. He was an active officer. He was, you know, he was in several shootings, which is very rare for police officers right. to even pull their guns in, in, in what they do. So he, he was, he wanted to go to the work, he said, he wanted to be stationed in the worst precinct in all of New York. Like that was his desire because he wanted to do help. Like he felt like he would be of service in the most, get, put me in the worst spot. Yeah. And yeah. they did. And he became a sergeant. He went up the ranks. So for you, for him, it was like a total betrayal of the system in that, there wasn't anything that he had ever done to even tip off that he would break the law. You know, he had no, and, and, and listen, they were investigating him for four years. They looked at all of our, they looked at everything. I said, they know my children's blood type, probably, you know, they, they know everything about you. They've gone through your bank accounts, your credit cards, your, your personal photos, probably your, you know, everything for years. Um, so the, the violation also he feels of his, of his privacy, our privacy, our lives, um, he feels betrayed. I think that's the worst. He feels that he, he's completely betrayed by a justice system which he once served, not just as a police officer, but when he became a private investigator after his injury, he worked on federal cases. So he has worked for the government on high profile cases as an investigator. So that also confused him. Like I, I'm okay to work on certain cases and I'm approved for years while he's being spied on by the government and investigated, but he's working for them as an investigator on like extremely high profile cases. I'm talking like death penalty cases, the archdiocese he worked for, for high profile people that I can't name because that, right. that would be betraying their privacy. Right. Um, so, you know, when the government has been looking through everything and they know that, how is he able to do all those things and not right. be in, yeah. brought in and, and talk spoken to over the years, you know, like, um, so, you know, just to kind of go back a little bit about what happened. So no, your, your say, your listeners, well, yeah. before I get there, when I heard 5,000, yeah. I heard the number $5,000, I was like, yeah, come on. Right. Man. There's something fishy. Right. Come on. There's I have a lot more money. Yes. I'm fishy there. I felt something fishy just hearing yeah. that part. I was like, come yes. on. You will do a lot more for a lot more. A lot less for a lot more. I wear it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not. Yeah. 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 No, yes. no. Yes, yeah. So go, yeah, start from, yeah. So what happened to him? Because he he's doing his job. He's a high pro. He's doing his job. Right. What happened? 
Yeah, he's doing his job. And so he probably worked over, I don't know, 500 cases as a private investigator. And in 2016, he got a phone call from a translation company in Queens, New York. And they were looking for a PI who had to be licensed in New Jersey. They had a client who had money stolen from his uh, family's construction company, and he was trying to find the assets. So uh, the person that stole the money, what was he spending it on? Was he buying houses? Was he buying cars? Was he, what's he doing? Very common. That's like, for the private yeah. investigator, that's like a normal, easy yeah. peasy thing. All public record. It's all public record. That's the other thing. These are all public records. So he's basically handing over information that he finds that is public. Got it. He gets, uh, he meets with uh, his client who came in from China because the man, but he spoke perfect English. He was cordial. He was said, this man stole this money from me. It was millions of dollars. And I need to know what he's doing with it to kind of build a case against him, right? Civilly, it was a civil matter. Okay. And so the government wants you to believe, everyone to believe that at that meeting, this person said to my husband, I want you to harass this person. I want you to make him feel like his life is in danger. I want you to pressure him to go back to China. I want you to become part of our team to harass him, okay? That he left that meeting. Okay. And then my husband, after that meeting, called two retired NYPD detectives he had worked for before to help him on the case. He spoke to two federal agents about the case at the time. And then he has another meeting with his client at the law firm where he was working my husband out of at the time. So he brings these supposed people who are bringing him in on a, a crime to a, a Panera Bread first was the first meeting in front of every, like people having lunch. Second yeah. meeting is at a law firm where there's lawyers walking by, there's yeah. receptionists, it's a very small, and he's having a conversation about harassing people. Um, he notifies the local police every time he was doing surveillance, he does reports. He does invoices for cash when he got cash. He do documents everything. Like he still has it. He still had everything when he was arrested okay. four years later. Okay. So he does a couple days of surveillance. The subject never saw him when he was doing surveillance. Couldn't identify him at court. Oh, okay. The, the guy never filed a police report about being followed by anybody. He didn't file a protective order. He couldn't. He had Mike. He, they, Mike stood up at trial and he said, they said, do you know who that is? He said, no. So he, he was done with his work on this case in April of 2017. He only worked a few days on it okay. to, in total. He made about $5,000. Okay. Um, again, you know, it's important to understand something. And I, I don't, I'm not bragging. It's, this is just the reality. And, you know, in 2016, we owned our own house. We had no mortgage. It was a million, over a million dollar house. We had money in the bank. We had no debt. We were both working when we wanted to. We were not working because we had to. We were very blessed. Yeah. So the fact that anyone would think that he would, and he did tons of pro bono work as a private investigator all the time, all the time. If he felt like somebody couldn't afford it, he's like, you know what? They're innocent. I want to help. I'm going to do it for nothing. The fact that, you know, he, they would even think that is insane. He doesn't think about this for four years. And then they come to our house and arrest him in front of my kids on a pre-dawn raid. And they bang on the door. They wait, come wait, to wait, the wait, house. Wait, wait, Stop there for a second. Wait a minute. So... He finishes a job in 2017. Life goes on for four years. You, yes. you, you like literally, your life has gone on. That's just one of yep. many cases he worked on. Life goes on, and then out of then out of nowhere, well, for you out guys, of nowhere, out of nowhere. Okay, let's just start, go, go, go go there. Okay, start. Okay, there. so so what you have to understand is that in 2017 of April 2017, the there was there were people doing nefarious things that okay. had nothing to do with Mike. Okay. Had nothing okay. to do with him. It's, it's like you having a meeting at, you know, you have a meeting with your friend, your friend goes off and robs a bank. Are you responsible oh. for him robbing the bank? No, right. of course not. They no. go off and do their thing. He has no idea. And no. the government knows this, right? They know that he had, he didn't do anything. He never, he was never asked to do anything illegal. He was never asked to do it because he wouldn't. And the, the FBI had my husband's information in April of 2017, because one of the bad people tried to flee the country in, in, and leave. They stopped him at the airport, questioned him, downloaded his phone, got his information, and then let him leave the country, knowing he had been involved. Yeah. And then he came back, that man. They interviewed what? him again for two days. It, yes. Let him go again. Okay. So the FBI spoke to the, the criminals for four years. 
over and over again, but they never spoke to my husband. They never spoke to the two retired NYPD guys. They never spoke to the two federal agents that Mike spoke to. They never spoke to, as far as we know, two other um, people that Mike had worked with on the NYPD were in the same office as the case FBI case agent. They worked in the same, two people Mike had worked with in, in the NYPD worked in the same office as the case agent on this case. And they never spoke to them. Now we know that, why do we know that? Because, because if they had, they would have spoken to these two young, these two guys and they would have said, what are you talking about? Mike McMahon, the guy's a hero. Like right. this guy is like lived a life of, of, you know, he's an incredible cop, human being, et cetera. But they did speak to the criminals, the Chinese criminals for years and let them leave. So, you know, if they had come to Mike, the, look, there was another case that was going on in the Southern District of New York about Fox Hunt. It's called Fox Hunt, where they try to oh. repatriate Chinese people to go back to yeah. China. But those are dissidents. Those are people who are speaking out against the government. The man my husband was following was not a dissident. Okay. He's not a citizen. He was investigated for fraud, for immigration fraud. He had multiple LLCs and he was not speaking out against the government. He okay. was wanted in China for embezzlement and um, taking bribes. So we're not talking about people who were speaking out against the Chinese right, government right. and then, okay, th let's, be, let's be very clear here. Yeah. This man was sued civilly, successfully, to oh. the tune of $15 million. Um, it was put on hold. The case was, the civil lawsuit was put on hold while uh, our trial was going on. Um, and then we just found out it had been, it's been dropped against him a few weeks ago. That's another story. So yeah. let's get back. I don't want to get off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. all. It's all but, every, but, every, every part of this is fascinating to me. I'm like, what? Like, my mouth yes. goes, what? Okay. So, I know. It's, it's my, so he, basically he goes into, he gets arrested. They don't tell him what he's being arrested wait, for, wait, by wait, the way. Wait a minute. So you guys are at, like I said, you're living your life. Like, like right now, I'm, living, I'm talking to you on here. I'm living yep. my life with gold in. And then somebody yep. does it on my door. So that's, so basically mm -hmm. that's what happened to you guys. It was a, you said it was a raid at night? Or in the morning, six six thirty in the morning. And they knocked on the door and, you know, you get up. And as a wife of a law enforcement, my husband always said, if, if you know, if the, if the knocks come, someone's dead. Like that's, that, that's not good news. Oh, if, the, if the cops are at your door. Got it. Got it. Got so they're saying Michael, they're saying Michael McMahon, Michael McMahon. That's my husband, my, also my son's name. Oh, so yeah. for about two minutes, I think my son is dead. Oh my God. Okay. Yes. Okay. Got it. That goes through your head. Yes. And then they realize it's for my husband. They okay. don't handcuff, they don't handcuff my husband. Okay. They're very cordial. They let him go to get changed. And he's okay. like, why am I being arrested? What's going on? And they don't tell him. They don't tell him why he's being arrested. They don't tell him at all why he's being arrested when he went down to speak to the FBI. He spoke freely for two hours. They never tell him why he was arrested. Okay. He's trying to help. He's trying to like figure out what, what was going on. Um, so as he's being, as he's leaving the house, they never went to his home office. So they never took his guns. They never took his cameras. They never took his phone ever. They never took his notes. They don't, they have, and when he offered it to them at our house, when they were there, they said, we're not interested. We don't want it. So I'm thinking, this is a case about national security and you don't want to see his office. You don't want to take his guns. You don't want to look at his notes. You don't, you know, you don't. So the whole thing was weird. That is so weird. he goes and speaks to them for two hours. And when he walks out, they hand him the criminal complaint. That was the first time he ever knew what he was being charged with. Okay. And he reads it and he's like, what the, he goes, right. what? He goes, excuse me. And he, goes, he goes, I want you to tell your boss, I have no idea what Fox Hunt even is. I've never heard of it before. I would never stalk somebody. This is ridiculous. I, would, I was parked on a public street. I notified the local police. I don't stalk people. I don't break the law. I mean, he lost it. He was so angry. Sure, I'm sure. And that's where all hell broke loose because he came home. You know, the press was outside our door. We had my pictures of my children being taken through our windows. They took pictures of me. They they were knocking on my neighbor's doors, asking what it was like to live next to a Chinese spy. Oh my. Uh, and my neighbors basically told them to, you know, go F themselves because Good. they were great people. And they said, Good. yeah. Um, and they parked outside for a couple, for three or four days. And they didn't get, and we wouldn't talk to them, obviously. 
and then we start putting the story together. You know, Mike had saved every invoice. He never just good. he never got rid of his phone. He had he had everything. Oh good. So we pi compiled everything, and we was like, all right, once they see this, once they see everything, this should stop. Like yeah. this proves my innocence. Not only did they not drop it, they put a superseding indictment against him using his own evidence that he provided to them. Yeah. So now we're like, okay, we're, they're, they're, they're putting their heels in here. Okay. This is going to get ugly. You know, this is war. And, you know, when you start looking at discovery, when they start sending the evidence, now, you know, there's no evidence of his guilt in there. We know that for a fact, because we have everything. We have every message. We have every invoice. We have everything. You're looking for what they knew and didn't provide to us and protect us. Were we exposed to Chinese criminals? Were they coming by my house? Who did they talk to? Who did they, who said anything that was bad about Mike, right? Who was that? So, you know, I'm sorry. You don't see that, do you? Okay. I, okay. I said, um, we're looking through a needle in a haystack because you're, you're oh. talking about thousands of pages of discovery. You're talking about, uh, binders and, and 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 you know it and you're not allowed to bring it home you're oh, prevented you're from bringing it, you, you can't take it home you can't take it's all secret it's all sensitive so you can't you have to look at it in your lawyer's office and all i can tell you is the fact that the government saw the evidence that proved his innocence and known for four years that he had done nothing wrong and never and and continued with this case but we you, you people have to understand something when you're, you're prevented from, from presenting a lot of evidence at trial in a federal case, because if the person is not here, let's say they're in another country, you can't use their statements at court in trial because you can't, they can't. So anybody that was in your favor that exonerated you, who may be not here, et cetera, you can't put that, put that evidence in. So you're basically using your own evidence as a defense, which should you know, and the, and the, you know, I think what people need to understand a couple things, the government didn't have one piece of evidence against him that showed him to be guilty. Nobody testified against him. They had, they couldn't identify him, right? They had nothing. They had we literally had nothing. So they lied. They made it up. They made up a story at day one at trial. Their opening statement was, was a fantasy. And I was so angry. I mean, it was filled with the, the, the galley was filled with people, FBI agents, rookies, prosecutors, Breon Peace, who's the head of the SD Eastern District of New York. He came for the opening prosecution statement, but left. He didn't stay for ours. It was it was filled to the rim with people. And when they did their opening statement and took a break, I stood up and I said, what a bunch of liars. What a bunch of liars. I was so disgusted what they did because they told the judge they promised the judge that they were going to bring witnesses to prove their allegations. And so she allowed a lot of things in on their side to make him look bad, to make Mike look bad because right. they promised the judge. And guess what? They never brought witnesses. And our witnesses, one of them took the fifth the day that he was supposed to testify for us after he had met with the government a couple of times, you uh -huh. know, and it was, yeah, that was heartbreaking. Yeah. Heartbreaking yeah. because we knew they knew they yeah. knew that he was this guy was going to be help us oh yeah so yeah. It, it's it's it is really and so so what he was charged with was conspiring to violate the foreign agents registration act which you're hearing a lot about now a little bit with hunter biden it's kind of floating around it's like it's very arbitrary they're charging some people with it menendez but they're not charging other people oh. with it it's, it's so it's a administrative task where it's free online, you go online, I'm working for a foreign company or whatever, you know, maybe, maybe it's yeah. a government, you know, as a lawyer, it's very, it's a lobbying thing. It's not, has nothing to do with private investigators, yeah. nothing, because you're allowed to have, a, you're allowed to work in your business. You're not yeah. allowed, it's not, has nothing to do with lobbying. He wasn't working for a foreign government, so he should not have, he didn't have to register, yeah. but he was charged with it, okay? Because apparently the pr people, were connected to but he didn't know that he was working right. for a client who happened to be from new york who came in and said i stole this guy stole my money which yeah. he did um so he was charged with that and then 
but he was found not guilty of conspiring to do it, but he was found guilty of doing, of violating it. Like, so he, they, they found, they could not prove their case, which was that he was conspiring with a foreign government. Got it. He was found not guilty on count okay. one. Okay. Because there was so much evidence that he didn't know and right. had no connection to the foreign government. Right. So then I'm like, why are we here? Yeah. So he was found guilty of not of violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which is why we're appealing our, our motions to turn, overturn this case are in now. He was found guilty of conspiring for interstate stalking and interstate stalking, which the guy never even filed a police report that he was being filed. But they, so what happened was when he was done in 2017, when he finished his, his work and never thought about it again, right? Never thought about it again. 18 months later, somebody put a threatening note on the door of the subject that said, go back to China and pay your debts or, you know, you, you go to jail or something. They charged my husband with that. 18 months later, that happened. It, the address is public. It's online. You can find it. Mike found it, public the address. This is not a secret. This guy is not living. It's public. <laughs> so well, how can you they didn't, they didn't test. Yes. They, they, they didn't test like the handwriting or fingerprints or. Oh, they did. And it had nothing to do with Mike. Absolutely nothing. This is, this nothing. Is scary. This is scary. Okay. It's, it's, okay. it's scary. It's also scary that. There's, there's, what after Mike was done, like my, this is my point, which is, which is what's so scary. There was no crime had occurred with my husband. He right. didn't do anything illegal. Okay. So if the government wants to build a case against a case, let's call it a case, not necessarily against someone, but a case okay. against the Chinese. Okay. That was a big thing. It was a China initiative came into play in 2008. They got to bring Chinese cases and got to bring Chinese cases in. And they looked at all their cases. Michael is the only American, the only U.S. citizen. He is a hero. He makes a really good face for this case, right? Because the China initiative was deemed to be maybe racist. And, and it, it was like they were going after Chinese people, okay? So this is what really pissed me off, is that the government, the FBI claims that Michael should have known that because his clients were Chinese, that they must be behind the Chinese government. That's which racist. is ridiculous. That's racist. Complete right. that completely. He right. he should have known. I mean, Michael has not. He doesn't racially profile people. He's not going to be uh, right. he, that. He takes his clients. These are right. clients of his right. who he's doing work for. Right. So you know to say that he should have known because the guy was wanted in China and there was a wanted poster of him of the guy that he was following. They want. They said that he should have known that that the people hiring him were connected to the ch Chinese government. Now, here's what's really disturbing: is that the FBI knew where this guy was. They knew about this person. They had been. They knew all about him. So, yeah. if 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 they knew where he was, what difference does it make if Mike's working for a client? You know, like. You see my point? Like, uh, well, it's not like he, he was, he was fighting. It wasn't like he was right. in high, yeah. he was, it was a public address. Like this man was right. yeah. <laughs> not, it's, it's, you know. It's, you know, Martha, it's like you. Okay, so you get a job on a movie or a TV show and the producer is doing something over here. And you didn't know, you, and you should have known a producer was doing, like, well, I don't right. research a producer before I get right. a job. Oh, I'm I'm hired. I'm They're hiring me to do uh, to a role. I don't, I don't, I don't. You look at every director's work and what they're doing in private life. Like, you know, I mean, right. it's a client. You're looking at the client. You're like, okay, they hire you. You say yes, so you do your job and you exchange monies and thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you very yeah. much. And you hire two NYPD intelligence guys who were, you know, now PIs and you speak to two federal agents. You know, the fact that the federal agents, the FBI agent that he spoke to about this case and then another federal agent, who had no concern about him working on this case. See, See, in 2016, China was not what it what we know about it today. Right. And, and and what's really going on. Now, if the FBI had been doing their job, they would have brought my husband in and all of those people to say, what's going on here? What's what are you looking into? What what can we do to make it better and 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 learn? I went into the local police after this happened, where this in the town where this occurred, yeah. there were two police departments. They had no idea this, this was going on. 
They had no idea that this man was wanted. They had no idea that this op these operations were happening in their towns. And I was, I shared, I educated them on what was happening, yeah. how to, what to look out for, you know, th th and the FBI still has never done anything to, to share information with the local police about these operations, you know, and it's, it's really scary that the FBI was willing to sacrifice us. They had, these people had our home address. They had our bank accounts because Mike was doing business with them that they would put my family at risk for four years. I mean, you, when he was arrested, the head of the FBI did a press conference, as did John Demers, who was the head of national security or national yeah, national security, saying that these people, these bad guys, were acting like an organized crime syndicate. And I'm thinking, so you're gonna let you let my family be exposed to that for four years right. and 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 not protect us and give us a warning. And just so everybody understands something, our government has an obligation to warn you if if you've been targeted by a foreign entity in that respect. And I met with um, Richard Grinnell, who used to be the head of the director of national intelligence in DCA. I saw him and he said, I told him what happened. And he said, you, you're, they should have been given a defense briefing. Your, your husband, the law enforcement should have been given. He goes, I used to do them all the time with local mayors and councilmen. Oh. And I said, well, why wasn't my husband given that? He goes, somebody decided not to, I guess. I'm like, okay. So we were, we were sacrificed for a case you know, it was an optics case, you know, it, it's, our government does that a lot. They, they, they have a press conference, they bring a case in, but the people are either out at large or they're, you know, um, they're not here. They're, they're never coming back, right? They're never coming back from China or it's just for optics only, but you know, what they did to my family for optics is, is, unforgivable to me. I mean, I, 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 I don't, but we're fighting. I mean, we fought, we went to trial, which, you know, in, 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 in federal cases, 90% of people take plea deals, 90% either a they're guilty, B they can't afford it. They can't take it emotionally. Um, of the, 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 the other people that go, then 8% get it dropped before trial based on motions or, you know, and only 2% go to trial. 2% of cases go to trial. Of that 2%, prosecution wins 98% of the time. And they know why? Because they have it on their side. They, we were not allowed to talk about Michael's history as a cop at trial. We could not bring up his career, we're not allowed. We were not allowed to talk about the civil lawsuit against the man he was following, not allowed. We couldn't show his, his interrogation video, the whole thing, they wouldn't let us. They only showed one or two minutes of it on their side. We we're prevented from so much. It, it, it's shocking to me in this day and age that if you have evidence of your innocence, you should be able to present it at trial. Like if you're being accused of being a uh, an enemy of our country and a, and a betrayer, a traitor to our country, you should be able to show any piece of evidence that proves that you are not that person. And that did not happen. I mean, it is it is so in the favor of the prosecution. They have loopholes everywhere to prevent you from from pr putting evidence in. And every day, I'd I'd sit there and I want to just climb out of my sh seat. And and I was so angry. I was so angry at at all of them. You know, nobody who worked on my husband's case testified. the The case agent didn't testify. No federal agents testified that were involved with the case. So we couldn't cross-examine anybody. So they would bring in a third party person to read something into the record, just read into the whatever they were told. Yeah. And we couldn't question them because they didn't work on the case. So how is, how is that how is that fair? You know, we should be able to bring, ask questions and inquire, you know. Well, what you're, what um, you're saying, but what you're saying is, because what I, what I was taught in law and all this stuff is that the burden mm -hmm. of proof is on each side to present their case. And mm -hmm. you watch people's court, they tell you alone, have all your receipts. If you have all the receipts, that right. should that should be fine. That's, that's what we're taught. It should be right. fine. They, no, I didn't do this. See, here's all my evidence. Here's somebody to correct. Have. And you're telling you know what you're what you're what you're telling me though is in this case, I'm sure hundreds of others, this didn't happen. This was not yeah, allowed. No, it didn't. 
This was not allowed to happen. That's Can what's you imagine? Scary. Could you imagine to, that to be a prosecutor to work so hard to prevent evidence from coming to trial that's exculpatory to the to the defendant? Like right. to go out of your way to make him look like a bad person? I mean, they couldn't find one bad thing about him. Like they went through his record, his NYPD record. They went back to 1995. They found one civilian complaint against him. And they were like, he had a civilian complaint against him. But what they didn't say was the person who complained against him was a gang member who was trying to recruit kids in a, in a middle school who complained about him. But they they didn't care. So you're they tried to make him look like he used his friends, that he was a cheat, that he was a bad person. I mean, it made me want to throw up. And my poor sons had to listen to that. But they wanted to come. They asked to come. Okay. And I'm glad they did because they saw the players. You know, the guy that actually arrested my husband, who came to the house, who scared my children, didn't have the stones to even yes. show up. Oh, he didn't. Didn't even show up to trial. Never came. And just retired recently. Oh, okay. I wanted my kids to see him. I wanted them to see his face so they can say the boogeyman. This is the book. This is the man that did that to you, who traumatized you. Look at him. He's a nothing. He's a nothing. He is he is hiding behind the three letters. And now that he's not there anymore, you know, they have the protection of all these this this. But here's the thing in the NYPD, you can't lie on a complaint. You can't falsify evidence. You get fired. You get your pension taken away. The fact that the FBI can lie on criminal complaints, proven lies, continue that lie at court, and they're immune? Right. Is wrong. It is wrong. And if in this in the long run, we we as given this position to say, why is that? How did that happen? And here's the other thing. We teach our children to do the right thing. Yes. Don't lie. Right. Just because you can steal the candy bar doesn't mean you can, you should steal the candy bar. Right. Because you still at the end of the night had to put your head on a pillow and say, I stole the candy bar. Nobody knows I stole the candy bar, but right. I stole the candy bar. What kind of person am I that I did that? This right. is like the fact that they could get away with it doesn't mean they should. And here's the, here's the, we know so many people who were our great people who work in the federal government, the system. No, no who are great people who are horrified by this because I'm it makes sure. them look bad. It makes them look like they're, because they're not part of that. They don't do that. My husband, he's like, I, it, we, you would be ostracized on the NYPD. If, if, they, if it came out that you were doing some shady stuff, you were seen as, as like the worst possible person. Right. Nobody, uh, uh, nobody, nothing that a good cop hates more than a bad cop. Yeah. And I, I am, I, I said it to the guy's face, the FBI agent who was the case agent at the trial. I'm like, you're a liar. I'm like, you crossed bright pocket. I went, you're a liar. You know, and he just went, he just couldn't even, couldn't even look me in the eye because they know, they know, they know that they, they know, they know what they've done here is, is, is wrong. So, you know, we are, we are, you know, our, our jury got um, CCP propaganda put on their doors during deliberation. That was on day two. Um, they, they were sleeping. Some of the jurors were sleeping for half an hour, 45 minutes. Could you imagine your life is on the line and you look over and they're snoozing? Somebody pulled their hood down thing and was just out, like out for like a half an hour. I think this, this is our life. Right. You know, but, but the judge saw that too. Okay. 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 Good. Okay. Okay. She, she was, she saw all the evidence and she's there to, facilitate the process okay. she is not there to decide what's right. okay but now she's in the position to decide because we filed motions to overturn the, the verdicts and grant us a new trial based on all the evidence that you know happened at trial you know on day one they falsified evidence they put a picture up and said it was from april 2017 knowing it had been from six months prior and had nothing to do with what this story they created and we said objection that 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 picture is not you're right. you're claiming it's from one time when it was from another time that's a lie that's that's that is 
manipulating the evidence to make it beneficial to the prosecution. How is that not, how is that okay? You know, I, and then the woman, they said, when was that picture taken? She goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Cause she never saw any, she, nobody, none, nobody ever filed a police report about being followed in this case. How can you be charged with interstate stalking if you've never filed a police report? Look, you and I, we, listen, how many, I said the burden of proof for stalking in this country is so high. How yeah, many women get followed by their ex-boyfriends, messages, phone calls, and these poor women who cannot have no recourse in this country to, and how many get killed? That's yeah. stalking. And they're still not protected, mm -hmm. right? But you're going to tell two, three cops, three, three retired cops who were parked a half a mile away, who notified the local police every single day they were there, told them they were armed, make a model of the car. My husband went actually into the police department one day to make the report. You're going to say that's interstate stalking when you never left New Jersey and you parked on a public street a half a mile away and the person never saw you? What are we doing here? Why? How did this even happen? But here's what's so scary for your listeners is that my husband did nothing illegal. He did everything that was legally allowed as a private investigator. He, did, he didn't break any law, zero, zilch. And yet here we are. So I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent. Right. I don't care if you, 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 you know, raise kittens. It is, we cannot allow, just because we don't, we want that person to be guilty of a crime because we don't like them, their politics, right. their position. Right. Right. If they do it to me, and they do it to everyday Joe because they need to build a case. Nobody is safe. Nope, it, you know, it's like it's like arresting a plumber for changing a pipe is what they did to this private investigator. Arresting a private investigator for doing surveillance and background checks and asset searches is is wrong. I mean, right. that's what they do for a living, right? right. Okay. So we have to fight back and set a precedent here to say if see the thing is if this verdict sticks. It is now a federal offense to park on a public street. So news organizations do it. Right, to right. stories. In insurance companies use yeah. surveillance for fraud. Yeah. Um, if let's say you decide that I don't like that guy parking on the street. I've seen his car there a couple of times. I'm going to call the FBI and I'm going to have him arrested for a federal crime because now it'll be considered a federal crime to park on a public street. And it, it could be. Can you imagine the ramifications of that? No, no, no that's crazy. That, yeah, it's it's it is crazy. And and I I've, I've I spoke to private investigative um people, investigators. I spoke at their meetings and you know and they're I said your industry's done. You're finished. Right. Right. It sticks. You have to support us and fight and but they're scared right. because they're intimidated. You know, they're intimidated by the government who isn't right. um rightfully so. Right. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to sit by and allow them to do this to my family. My husband in particular, who is a hero. I mean, he is a he is a guy that would take a bullet and has for strangers many times. He saved children's lives. He's run into burning buildings. He's delivered children in crack houses, babies like in, in, and saved their lives. Like this is a guy we need on the street to help us. And what you've done is if you've handed you've kneecapped him. So he can't work. He can't. He's now considered a traitor in the press and to forget in the media. It is another problem. Huge problem. Huge yeah. problem. Because when I have reached out to certain media outlets who have printed false information, misleading information and said, You're, why aren't you doing the whole story? I get crickets, you know. And some of the writers would be sitting in court and they'd come in for an hour, like from the New York Times, and then they would leave. And I'm like, you're missing the you're you're missing the real story here. Is that we have Chinese criminals running around our towns in New Jersey, and they're not, not telling anybody, and it's still going on. Why are you not writing about that? Why are you not writing about our family being sacrificed by the Department of Justice? Because they're they they're this they're like this. Yeah. So when you people get you know I was on I did a podcast the other night with Amy Nelson we did spaces oh, yeah. together and Amy she's amazing like she's she is my hero you know and she says I don't care who you vote for and I don't care who you vote for it doesn't matter we're talking right. about right and wrong here 
So, and in the media, you know, both of us have gotten flack about going on certain media outlets. Like, I have to tell my story. Right. Hello. These people. Hello. And if if it's, I don't care. If I'm on, I tell my story. Yeah. If you want to have me on, and there's millions of people who are going to hear my story, it's, I have to do it. Yeah. And she said the same thing. You know, she's gotten flack for certain things. And they should be asking the question, why aren't the other news outlets telling the story? Why are, this is actually every, every, this is an American story. This is about overreach of our government and the FBI going off the rails and not doing their job. And we should be all concerned about that. It shouldn't matter about politics or whatever. You know, well, we've, well, we've lost nuance. We've lost nuance. We've lost nuance. So we, even, we've I completely mean. lost nuance. Yeah, they're, we've they're, lost they're, nuance. And yeah, we have. But maybe we can, you know, maybe our stories, Amy and my, our story is, will help bridge that because it, and, and Amy had a really good point. She goes, when we fix the justice system, when we fix it, then we won't have as much bipartisanship because it will be equal. It'll be an equal distribution of the law. Because yes. one thing can't be illegal for one person and legal for another. Very true. Yes. And we're seeing that all over. And yes, this is not are. a new thing. No, I get, but if you're rewriting, if you're taking legal activity and moving over to a lane to illegal activity because you needed to, that's extremely dangerous. And in Amy's case, her husband also didn't commit any crime, didn't nothing, there was no crime, but they destroyed their lives, you know, and costs millions of dollars. You know, you're, if you want to fight the government, you better have a million dollars to start. And I'm not saying we do, and I'm not saying we did. I'm just right. saying that at some point it will cost you at least a million dollars, whether it takes you 10 years to pay it off or you, you know, it's going to cost you at least that amount to fight the government. And they know that, oh, they, they know don't. that, they know that they're going to break you. They're going to try to break you emotionally, physically, financially. Um, but listen, I'm no wallflower, you right. know, I, 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 I was raised by strong women. Um, and my, my father who didn't give a rat's ass what people thought of him because he was honest and he was truthful and he was a hard worker and raised me with, to have integrity and fight and not take any BS. Like when Liz Hubbard who played Lucinda for everybody's watching who, who, who knows Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth Hubbard had been a prisoner of war. And if anybody knew that at one point, she was, had to be rescued. She spoke to leaders of, of government in Bosnia and Africa. She traveled, she spoke at the UN. She went to DC many, many times. And a lot of people didn't know that about her, that she was um, an advocate for women for refugee women she did a lot of work for refugee women and i would talk to her about my case and she was so encouraging and so helpful in my fight you know as 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 a woman as a mother as a wife you know she right. loved michael she loved my husband and her last words to me i i swear to you i i said first i thanked her for everything she had done for me in my life I said, you know, and I went down the list of all the things that she had done for me in my life. And she looked at me and she said, you can do more. Mm. And I went, okay. I got the message loud and clear. Oh, yes. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And don't be afraid. You know, when Lisa Brown passed away and Elizabeth passed away and, you know, through the, in the last three years, this has happened. And I thought, you know, life is so short life is so short what do you stand for what are you gonna teach your children right you're gonna teach your children to be bullied you're gonna let them beat you up you know are they you're gonna let people who are who are hiding behind power destroy right. you because they can no i'm not, not gonna let that happen you know it's brutal though it's absolutely brutal you gotta you really have to have a thick skin to uh fight the government and push back against that them i it's know not I, easy I, it, I just, you know, hearing your story, it's, it's such a scary thing because you hear about stories like this and you mm -hmm. read about them. You're the first person I actually know that's kind of going through this, but mm -hmm. I, I have seen, I, you hear these stories, these, these stories come from you like, 
that sounds crazy. And then you're right. like, oh, and it's happening to that person over there. But like, it's yes. happening to you. And it's like, yeah. and this is something I'm, I'm telling you, the part that gets me is that you finish a job, you think everything is yeah. fine, and you go on with your life. And it's, and it's right. out of nowhere, years later, your life's turned upside down. It's not yes. even like an idiot. It was like, it was like that happened a month later, like you said, they started coming after him. It was like years later. Years. Like, oh, years. You to do that with your life like it's yeah. over. And they they said, okay, no, let's let's ruin your life right now. Let's just do it right now. Right um, now, a week a week before the election, it was the week before the twenty twenty election, and you know my 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 spidey senses go. Right. Why? Because all the bad guys had fled the country. Like the real bad people had right. fled the country years ago. Right. Years ago. So yeah. why would you want to arrest my husband? Put it in the newspaper put his picture in the paper as a China, you know, muscle, this person a week before the 2020 election. Mm, right. Hmm. Mm. With China, you know, listen, the one thing I have to say about being a right, I write, you know, and I, I've done a lot of, you know, obviously acting and things, you know, you, you analyze a lot of things. Yeah. And the timing of, of it to me was very strange. Um, and I feel like it was, it was deliberate. Uh, because there was no why okay if the if the guy had put the note on the door the threatening note on the door in 2018 right right two years two years later you're arresting right. people for that act right okay and something that happened in 2016 right like there's something about it that's very and i've done my process of elimination and i've yeah. done i figured out i believe what happened um and we'll see if i'm right you know down the road but it's so what they did to us is so wrong um and and i i'm helping other people who are going through it as well like i've now met people who actually are going through similar situations yeah. and to give them some hope you know it's just yeah it's uh um look there's a, there's a, i'm sure there's a lot of people out there that want to speak up and want to say something and are afraid to to do it but yeah. the whistleblowers and people like that are really heroes. They really are true heroes. And they're going to help the future of our country by calling out what happened in several cases, many things that have happened. Um, you know, the Twitter files was amazing just to find out like what was going on behind the scenes, right? Like we would never have known that. And now people know. I'd rather yeah. people know. Educate the people. Give them yeah. the information. Let them yeah. decide how they feel, right? Exactly. exactly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's hell. It's, it's, it's really hell. And I, I, uh, I pray a lot, you know, I'm a, I'm a big person of faith. I, 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 the, the, the August before this happened, I had a vision of the blessed mother who came to me in my dream and flew into my heart, like physically flew into my heart. And I sat up in bed and went, wow, that was intense. Like something I, I was filled with this power. And if I, I didn't know what, what it was. Now I know what it was about. I know it's for, and I know it's about. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know what it was about. It was yeah. like the blessed mother was giving me the, the, the big push of love and, and, you know, strength to be ready for what was coming. And, um, as best as I could, you know, but it, it's, you know, you start thinking about like, I want everybody here to think about what if somebody was looking at your whole life for four years, everything. For 10 years 12 years how many years i mean right. maybe how far back five years six years seven years right. you know right. um following you my husband was followed to his doctor's appointments by unmarked cars and he he, he looked back now he goes oh now i know I, who that was i didn't know who the, i thought i was crazy like why are these yeah. two unmarked cars following me right. you never think you know yeah. To, to, yeah. and then there was a drone over our house mapping our house now i know it was the uh, fbi you know um and you start thinking, gosh, you know, like, what else did they do that we don't know about, you know, and what other, you know, what I think also is if they're lying on public documents, if they're lying on criminal complaints, what are they lying about that we don't, haven't seen, you know, grand juries, people need to understand when they go to a grand jury, that's secret, you'll never see those, you don't, right. you don't hear the minutes from a grand jury hearing. No. Um, that's why they say 99% of people get indicted because they can say anything they want. It's their version of the story, right? 
we, so, but we can do better. I, f- I mean, listen, I'm not going to stand here and say, I'm going to change the world, but I do feel like our story will hopefully set some sort of precedent, what they cannot do. And they need to retrain their FBI agents to say, if you have a lead, you know, if you get a lead, if you get a Michael McMahon's phone number in April, 2017, and you know that he is somehow involved in this, unbeknownst to him, by the way, like, Right. You need to follow up on that lead. You need to follow the leads and see where they go and not go down one path and ignore everything else because you this is what the story you want to tell. You know, it's like I always t- say that this, the analogy of if the if you know the murder weapon is underneath the rock by the lake and you don't go retrieve it because you want to get that guy, not the guy who owns that gun, you're never going to go get the gun. You're never going to even go, you're going to pretend it's not even there. And we've seen where that can be very destructive to people's lives, you know? Um, and Mike's saying, like, Mike's like, if that were me, I'm the NYPD. I, every nugget I had to follow, every investigation, I, I followed every lead and I reported it back because it could be nothing, but it right. could be everything. Right. Yeah. And if they had done that, if they had done that, you have to understand, if they had done that, they'd called him all the crimes that happened after that, it's on the FBI. Like yeah. if that guy was bothered or whatever else was going on, that could have been prevented. Like people still got bothered and harassed or whatever. So what, what like Mike was like, what, what if something had happened to me? Like what if someone had come to my, our house and beat me up, killed me, you? Like who's responsible for that then? If right. something had happened to our family, thank God it didn't. Thank God. But why why was it put at why was why were we put not that that would have happened Mike, but i'm just right. saying what who would have been responsible for that right you know why weren't we protected and, and and made aware that he had apparently met with someone who the government knew was here you know like this you know people it's chinese police officers had been coming to our country for years and being trained by our law enforcement they were taking classes at universities but our government knew they were here. They knew their real names. They knew why they were here. We had welcomed them to come. Right. right. So why all of a sudden, my, Mike has a meeting with a guy. Is he supposed to know anything? He gave him an alias, but that's not the point. Right. right. How is he supposed, if you, the government is letting everybody come around here and letting him train and you know, all that, why are they going after my husband for taking a meeting with a client? It's not a crime. Not no, a crime. At all. So not I, I still can't believe we're here. Like I still can't believe this even has happened. Um it's been three and a half year, three years now, three and plus. Um it's just scary. we're it's, it's just, it I think, is scary. I keep saying scary, but like I mean, I want people to know that this is like your whole livelihood is being turned upside down mm-hmm. and you're not being mm-hmm. allowed. And this country is always on due process, due process, burden of proof. Yeah, right. You're not, I mean, we know, some of us have known that doesn't happen for some of us, but it's happening to you and your family. That was even scarier because you guys are a different face on this. I mean, and I think it's, I think it's, I mean, it's a good thing in that way that we're seeing this happen to anyone. So so it's happening to those people over there. Well, no, actually, it's happening to those people over there too. It's happening to all. Yes. Right, it's every that that that, that no one's safe. That, that you said earlier, no one is safe. I'm but. telling you, Mike. I mean, Mike worked on a case where um, it was in a a kid was accused of murder. One, someone identified, you know, said he. I witnessed him shoot somebody. Right, and Mike met with the family, and he's like, he came home, and he's like, he met the kid, 19 year old kid, and he's like, he's innocent. He goes, he didn't do it. He goes, I don't, I don't know who did it, but I know that kid didn't do it. Right. But he would have been, so my husband did a grassroots campaign, did flyers, put them in the area where the shooting had occurred with his own phone number on it. And guess who he found the people who actually did the crime and the kid got off, uh, let out of jail. Oh, thank God. That kid would still be sitting in jail right now for the rest of his life for murder one. My husband did that for pro bono. He did it for free. He's like, this kid is innocent. Now, t- to your point, it this is not, 
if you can't financially defend yourself, I don't know what you do. You did you take the plea deal because you're like, I better off, right. you know, taking the deal, right? Take the deal. And you have prop things like the Innocence Project, which does wonderful work and has helped many people. Yeah. We can have to stop. We can help so many people not to get to that point that they right. have to get the Innocence Projects to help them. You right. know, but but I want people to understand. Mike and I both have made a vow that through this, when this is over, we will volunteer our time. We will give you investigative services. I will help you. I will help you. I'm, I become an incredible investigator through all this. Sure. I'm making a vow to people. I don't care where you live. I don't care what air, zip code you live in. If you've been accused of something that you didn't do, you should be able to fight that and not have to be take take that the time and go to jail because the odds are against you. Well, guess what? The odds are against a lot of people and there's different reasons why they don't fight, right? It, there, there's a lot of factors coming to play because here's the thing. They say, show me the man, I'll show you the crime. That's the saying, right? If, if God forbid you did something in 1998, <laughs> they're, gonna, they're gonna find that out. And then they're gonna go, well, remember what you did in 1998? Well, that's gonna come out for trial. That's good, we're gonna bring that up. We're gonna dust that off and bring that up, right? So, but you have to know that going into it. You have to know that this is gonna be tough and we're gonna fight. But if you haven't done anything wrong, if you really have not committed this crime, we will help you. You know, we will help you. We will, I, I promise you that. I've already started doing it. And and a lot of it's emotional support. That's a lot, a lot of it's emotional support. Yeah. But we'll volunteer, like we're going to volunteer our time to, to do these investigations and help people. And, and so, so people have to understand when private investigators are extremely valuable to lawyers, they do a lot of legwork for the attorneys. Mm -hmm. So they do investigations, they do inter interviews, they do background checks, they do, they, they, they speak to the witnesses, they, they, they do such a huge part of a lawyer's job. If the government starts to criminalize private investigators, like they're doing here lawyers are, are really in trouble there's twofold to that it hurts the law it hurts the client first of all because they're not getting a they're not that lawyers do not have the time to be going out and boots on the ground doing that but what what i want people to understand is that if we volunteer our time for you you're getting those services meaning we will help find the needle in the haystack to help you in these cases my husband's done it so many times where he's found the smoking gun and and gotten people exonerated you know that to him is is his mission in life is to help people i mean he stopped a, an, a robbery of an, a, an elderly woman in, in our neighborhood at the bank like a few months ago you know he turned he thought something was wrong he turned around and he went and he saved saved her you know he's gonna help you he's gonna help other people but man is it is it is it uh debilitating on so many so many levels but we'll we'll get through it oh you're strong you're gonna do it you know and I, I i just i just think again i'm just mortified at every single turn you explained that it's just that it just it could everything you're taught about law is just throughout the window that when it comes to something like yeah. this just, they're just like nah nah how easy that could happen to any of us in any situation yes so, nah, yes yeah so why should yes. you care? Why folks out there? Why should you care? Because, like she said, it could happen. It was happening to her and other folks. Don't say you're immune. You have no idea. It could no, be anything it could be anything. Could I'm be anything. 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 If it fits into what they need it to be, they'll find a way to do it. Right? They'll 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 look the other way. They'll they'll manufacture evidence. They'll lie. Um, you know, I. But you can't do that in the, in the NYPD and you can't do that like state. There's certain different rules for uh, state cases, civil yeah. cases. Yeah. Uh, there, there's federal. Federal is is so protected. Um, the FBI has been in trouble now for a long time. We're starting to learn a lot more about what the FBI oh, does to are, create are. cases yeah. and to, you know, to get the numbers, you know, get their numbers up. Um, but to me, weed out the people that don't want to do this for the right reasons. You know, weed them out. Get rid of them. Yeah. Just, just yeah. totally get rid of them, and you know, retrain the new the people that that are are willing to. You know, you can't. They have there has to be some accountability. You know, I always talk about the Larry Nasser case with the gymnasts who were abused. Oh, yeah. You know, that right there. 
the fact they didn't follow leads in that case is devastated hundreds of little girls' lives. Yes, they did. Yeah. Those, those agents were never held accountable for that. I know they weren't. Never. Yeah. No. No. And the FBI promised, promised, the DOJ promised the girls after they testified in front of Congress that they would do something. We're going to look into it again. Well, guess what? They didn't. So the girls sued them for a billion dollars. Sure did. Sure did. Is that what they have to do? Those poor girls had to go and sit in front of Congress right. and 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 relive their hell. They had to put them through that again. Like we have failed when we we failed those girls. This country, the, the Department of Justice, failed those girls, and to not hold those agents rec- accountable for for it is. It sends a terrible message, not just to our country, but to the other agents, you know, in the in, that are investigating things. But like I said earlier, the candy bar analogy, yeah. you know, we want the guys who would never steal the candy bar. My husband's never done anything wrong in his life. The guy has never gotten a parking ticket. Like I always used to say to him when we first met, I'd be like, what's it like to be perfect? And I'm not being, I'm not being ironic. I'm saying like, right. he is, he is right. the most honest, kind, generous, best father husband yeah, you're right. he is the best human being i've i've met in my i'm so blessed that i've that I've, that i've met him and that he was he's been with you know my crazy life and my crazy soap opera life and all the way yeah. my stuff um he's just he's the solid person that we all, all want on our side we don't want him to be we don't, we don't we don't want to destroy this man and put him and make him bitter and oh, and yeah. and feel like his what life was not a purpose anymore you know that he's you know we, we don't want that we want to we want him to win we want him to have justice so that he can be a beacon of hope for other people in the long run um that's what we want that's what we're, we're fighting for well i well he is very fortunate to have you my friend well thank you thank, so thank you and we did him wrong I say we, the royal we as in the country, we have done him wrong because yeah. if the good guys are getting in trouble, yeah, there, there's, there's yeah. just else to go from there. I mean, seriously, if, mm-hmm. if the good guys mm-hmm. are getting in trouble, then we're, then we're effed. I would say effed. Correct is the word I would say. Yes, we need, yes. Because, because you don't want to discourage the good guys. Like if no, you're, no. We need them to, they're, they're the ones going into the fire by choice. I mean, it right. takes a certain kind of yeah. man, man, woman to do that. And and if you're second guessing yourselves, that's when everybody is hurt. Uh, our safety, you know, and our security and our, we need our heroes. We need our heroes. Like 9-11 was, you know, you know, they went towards the fire. They went right. towards the fire knowing their fate. And we have demonized them so much in the last couple of years and the 99%, 99.999% of these people are heroes who just want to do good and want to help the community, right? Yeah. So we have to raise them up. We can still get, listen, the bad guys are the bad guys. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, get rid of them. Get them out. We don't want them, you know? Um, but he's, he's, you know, we're, we're, we, we need him. We, we need him as a, uh, on this planet, you know, to balance out evil. We need the good. We don't have that. We're we're really um, surrounded by no hope, and we can't have that. You know, we need we need to have hope, for yeah, sure. We do. Well, thank you, Martha, for sharing your story. I hope folks at home oh. now kind of get the idea of yeah. what's going on. They were asking me, so now you guys have the idea. Is is there anything else you feel like is unfinished or questioned about? No, I anything we'll, that I feel? No, right I didn't now cover? it's just we want to see what happens. Now I think I yeah. think. By, by this, now we're curious how you guys continue to fight and how this, hopefully this get overturned. And I think now yeah. we got to wait for the next chapter of this, basically. It's kind of, I mean, it's, a, it's like a soap opera, it's like, like a soap opera or a book, but like we got to wait for the next chapter. Right. Now wait it's like, sure. you gave us all the information, everybody now has it. Now we got to see if justice will prevail. And we're yes. in a country where we talk about that. It's supposed to be liberty and justice for all. That's what it's supposed to be. Correct. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. It way. is. Now, if anybody wants to assist or help or anything, that's what I was just at the end is what can they do for you? Well, so we, we have been blessed that there's a, an organization called the Pipe Hitter with an H, Pipe Hitter Foundation.org. And Michael has his own page there. 
Uh, it was started by um, a Navy SEAL who was falsely accused of murder, and he was uh, put in solitary confinement for eight months. Uh, he fought and it was exonerated at trial. Um, uh, a witness had come up and said he had lied and, and he was exonerated. So he started a foundation to help first responders, military who are falsely accused of crimes. Um, and they, I couldn't believe it when they took us on as, as we, I was, it came at such a, in a time of desperation and sense of feeling so alone. You know, we felt so alone and the press was terrible to my husband and really painting him as a, a terrible person. And when they believed him, it was really the turning point for us. You know, they're like, we, they don't give you money, but they give you a page so you can fundraise and they do press. They'll, um, and they're like, we're with you to the end. They said, we are with you till this is over. So he, it's Michael McMahon has his own page. There's more about the case there, a little bit more uh, story. And every penny goes right to the to the lawyers. Like every everything that we raise has gone right to our lawyers. We have a long way to go. We have a long, long way to go to, to uh, you know, put that in it behind us, but that's okay. You know, our lawyers are incredible and patient and they know he's innocent and um, we, we'll get there. But, you know, so if you want to donate, there's a hundred percent tax deductible and it goes right to, to the attorneys. Um, like I said, you need, you need these people, the, our lawyers are phenomenal and, you know, they know he's innocent, <laughs> you know, they know that, they're so horrified by what's happened to, to Mike. And, and they knew him. Like my husband's worked for some of the top attorneys in the country. I mean, he's done sure. some huge cases. They're like, Mike's like the best PI we ever had. He's the yeah. most honest guy. He's a great guy. So we'll get through this. So if they want to go to pipe hitter with an H pipe hitter foundation.org. And who it's, if you go to who we support, it's Michael McMahon, go to our page. And then he has his own page for, for donations. And, and we'll keep you updated on everything because we need support. You know, we need, not just just emotional support and and people understanding what really happened here um and that's how you change the script the script can't this this story cannot be my husband is a traitor to our country i refuse to let that be the end end of this discussion um it's because it's false and we'll get there we've been very blessed to have a lot of press and a lot of people listening to our story and um we'll continue to do that Yes, we will. And I, I said, I'm on your side. You know that. So I'm on your side. Thank and you. I want the Thank next you. conversation to be like, he's on here with you. And it's like, we did it. Yes. Yeah, yes. I yes. I, want. I do too. I do too. And you'll get to know him. He's an amazing person and funny. And yeah. he's just a, the heart of gold. He has a heart of gold. Yeah, you. So um, everybody, Martha Thank Byrne, you guys can follow her on Martha Byrne everywhere on social media. Of course, you can follow her there. Um, and see what's going on, but I'll put the stuff in the underneath the description. I'll put everything we can follow Great. her, hyper.org, and all that. So, you can give it. I hope for folks there who are asking the question, we answered your questions. Um, I'm yes. sure you can talk to her, you can message her, talk to her. I'm sure she'll answer. Yeah, of course. I, you can ask me anything you want. I mean, yes, if you go to my Twitter, we go to my Twitter feed. I have tons yeah. of oh, yeah. I, I have tons of clips that I've done, and um, a lot of, lot of interviews, and a lot of. Yeah. You know, uh, the New York Post just did another article about this Chinese, okay. the head of the Fox Hunt operations came here and met with people in D.C. And I was hard, I was like, wait a minute. So the guy who was in charge of these operations, who we're saying is a horrible, you know, these, these are hard, dangerous people, is having dinner with Anthony Blinken in D.C. I'm like, OK, this something, something, something's not right here. Yeah. Something is backwards. Uh, yeah. But, we're, you know, you know they just need to fix this. Then we'll yeah. deal with that <laughs> another time. <laughs> another time. Put it on the list. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, you can follow us at Daytime Today Everywhere. And I'm James Lott Jr. And we will talk to you next time.